our third distinguished lecturer of, of the season, and you're in for a treat. And before we get started, I would like to introduce our guest. Uh, we have with us this evening Mr. Ray Ferrero, Jr. Chancellor, Nova Southeastern University. <laughs> Mr. Alan Levan, Trustee, Nova Southeastern University. And Mr. Bob Moss, who will be inducted into the Hall of Fame this Friday. Mr. Moss, I, think, uh, I would love to have the members of faculty stand, would you please? All the faculty, all my colleagues, give them a hand. And I would like to personally recognize and thank our sharks, our students. Give yourselves a round of applause and stand up. I'm going to introduce Mr. Perez, tell you a little bit about him, and then we're going to run the video. You're going to see the same video that uh, everyone saw when he was inducted this past year, and then we'll have a format. He's not going to give a speech. He would rather engage all of us in a conversation, have a few questions to ask, but I'm going to ask you at any time if you have any questions to ask Mr. Perez from the audience that you'll be invited to do so. But this is a, a different format, but I'm sure that we're going to enjoy it. So uh, without further ado, uh, Mr. George Perez is founder and CEO of the Related Group, a leading residential development firm and one of the country's largest Hispanic-owned businesses. Mr. P Mr. Perez has been at the forefront of South Florida's urban evolution since, since the 1970s, and he has redefined all sectors of development, from affordable housing projects to luxurious condominium towers. A lifelong lover of the arts, Mr. Perez is an ardent supporter of institutions such as the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Miami-Dade Cultural Affairs Council, and the NSU Art Museum of Fort Lauderdale. He graduated summa cum laude, which is the highest honor that you can achieve academically, with a bachelor's degree in economics from Long Island University and uh, CW Post Campus and earned a Master of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Michigan. Mr. Perez, give him a hand. Please. I was born in, in Argentina with Cuban parents. Went to Cuba about six months later, customs in. They take all our money and we moved to Colombia. And there's where I spent my formative years. My parents paid a huge attention to education, particularly they would always say, you can, they can take everything away from you, like everything was taken away from them, but what they can't take away from you uh, is their education. And I pursued uh, philosophy and economics when I finished college and I decided to go to Europe and I stayed in Europe almost a year and that's where my love of cities occurred. I had a scholarship at Berkeley uh, to study development economics and I wanted to be an urban planner because of the love that, that, uh, that I gained in Europe about urban areas and how people live. After I got my master's degree, I came here to Miami and I became an urban planner you know, working for the city of Miami. The bureaucracy, particularly somebody that with me that was so intense, um, it tends to, you know, make you a nine to five um, and, and creativity and drive um, is not rewarded. So I became consultant to governments and I became a consultant to the private sector. I did a lot of market studies telling developers what they should be building, do I told myself, you know, this looks pretty neat, you know, maybe I should do it myself. So that's when I decided to jump into the private sector. This was 1978, 79. I had done a huge market analysis for a group of developers, and I told them instead of paying me what you had agreed to pay me, we had worked out that I would take 10%. And so I ended up with two 
old buildings in Little Havana, which is a low-income neighborhood of Miami, and that's, those were my first jobs. And I wanted to do public housing, affordable housing. I joined forces with my partner now for almost 40 years, Steve Ross. In the first year, we turned a profitable year. By the second year, uh, we were the largest affordable housing developer in South Florida, and then became, probably in the third year, the largest in Florida. The transition was from the affordable housing to much more market rate, uh, you know, first apartment rentals, and then the condominiums or mixed-use projects and so forth. I wanted to make sure that I worked with the greatest designers. From the very beginning, I wanted to incorporate art inside the buildings and outside the buildings, you know, so the rest of the public would enjoy that art. And we do this not only in our most expensive condominiums, but all the way to our affordable housing. We were very, very, very fortunate uh, that had um, profitable years, you know, without much adversity at all, since 1979 to 2009, and then this great recession hit 2008, 2009, 2010, and we had huge adversity. And probably um, people will tell you that they're that they're most proud of me, whatever that means, um, not during the time of success, but during the time where everything seemed to uh, to have no answer. And the biggest thing about it was humility. Right? We are not above the market, you know, we can get hurt just like anybody can get hurt. So we remained very, very calm and came up with uh, very transparent programs. So leading the troops with that philosophy was very, very important. And we learned, right? We learned about the things that could go wrong so we don't repeat them again. The guy need to work harder and be more prepared than anybody else. That's extremely important. Then education is very, very important because I think it gives you the background, the capacity to think, you know, uh, to adapt to change, hard work, education and preparedness. And then the other one, I think, is passion. And that passion, you know, breeds the competitiveness that I think everybody in this company, I hope everybody in this company has. A lot of people say, well, you know, related is George Duress. It's not. You know, I've been able to really learn how to give uh, real responsibility uh, to others. I don't put people in slots. You know, I like to think of us as renaissance men and women. You know, so instead of having, you know, one person that specializes in construction and one in marketing, this, my developers are jack of all trades. We are a company that does a lot. I mean, the other day I was with Forbes and um, they asked me, well, what are the projects? And I said, okay, let me let me give you, because I have a list of my projects. And they go, you've got to be kidding me. Um, we are working in over 70 jobs now at the same time. And probably three billion under construction right now. I feel like the basketball player that once said, you know, I can't believe they're paying me to do what I love to do. And I feel that way. You know, to me it's exciting every day. I come in and I meet architects and I meet designers and I'm, I'm doing different things that are meaningful to me and that make me a more complete person. So pick something that you love and that's the only way you're going to have the passion that you need to be successful. An entrepreneur is a person that takes risks because he believes that he has something to offer that people are going to consume. What Kierkegaard would call the leap of faith. You know, we, because all the information you gather still doesn't give you the right answer and there's no certainty as to the results. So we learn as much as we can and that gut feeling, which is very, very important, sets in and we take risk. At all times, we are a little bit on the edge. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't have to say anything. You're already <laughs> seeing it. <laughs> I have a couple of questions to ask you, and let's start with uh, tell us more about your company uh, and its beginnings, its evolution, and present success. You said you had about three billion in construction. Now I'm sure that's changed in the last in the last year or so. So, 
Yeah, no, we still have a lot of, you know, we still have a lot of projects under construction and as you saw from that slide, we we are now in um, not only in in a lot of uh, US cities but in uh, in cities around Latin America, five cities in India. Um, so we, you know, we've grown quite a bit. You know, the company started in 1979 as a result of um, like it's also said there, me doing a market study for a for a group of people that wanted to um, to do affordable housing in the city of Miami, and I had um, as a as a city employee uh, created the housing programs for the city of Miami. So it was easy for me to to be able to respond to the RFP, the request for proposals that the city put out, um, and. Um, and we won the RFP, and, and that's the reason that I met Steve Ross, who's my partner, um, who had also competed for RFP and, and did not have the knowledge of the city that I did. And, um, and we became friends, and so as opposed to just, um, you know, um, becoming opponents, you know, we, we became friends. And I put those units, you know, when I mentioned 10%, there were two, build, two little buildings in a downtrodden neighborhood, and, and that's the way the company started. You know, you know, it was then called Related Companies of Florida, and we afterwards changed our name to the Related Group just because the differentiation between, you know, Steve's company in New York, which are sister companies but with different ownerships, um, uh, and because we're no longer just in Florida, uh, but we are in, in a lot of other places. So, so we went through the transition of becoming you know, the largest, um, at one point, the largest uh, affordable housing developer in the country um, um, loved doing affordable housing because, um, because that's, um, that's what I studied, right? That's what I wanted to do. I wanted much more an entrepreneur to be a, a you know, a, a social coordinator, a social worker, you know, in, in, in many ways. I wanted to make a change for the better in society. And uh, that's why I went first to work for the city, and that's how I became um, a, a, an affordable housing developer. And what happened was that um, affordable housing put a lot of constraints on you. You know, the government only let you build these little boxes because it had to be affordable housing. It could only cost so much money to build. So I didn't get a chance to create. I didn't get a chance to do any buildings that would be iconic. I didn't get a chance to work with the great architects and the great designers. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to grow, um, to grow, and to be able to do iconic buildings. To be able to uh, meet with the best minds in the urban development, uh, urban planning, and design fields. And and that's why you know we moved from affordability, from housing affordability, to first market rate rental projects. Uh, First, smaller suburban projects, and then much more urban projects. Always been very involved in the city, uh, wanting to create that 24-hour city. So we moved into the city uh, with greater densities, um, and then finally uh, moved into projects that became much more iconic and, of course, much more expensive. Uh, working with the greatest designers and the greatest. Um, architects in the world, people like Rem Koolhaas, <coughs> Ron Kenorton, um, uh, Cesar Pelli, um, Herzog and Demjorn, um, and then designers like Philippe Stark that was there, and uh, Jelvin Puschelberg, uh, Piero Lissoni, some of the great, great, Patricia Rocchiola we're working now, some of the great designers. And this was a, it was a totally different change for me and a very exciting change because, again, the the give and take uh, between the developer and, and, and those consultants that make those projects great. So it, there was a progression that took, you know, 40 years now, you know, they've been doing this, you know, 100,000 units later. Um, we've sort of done the whole gamut of, uh, of everything that has to do with housing, residential, hotel, office, and commercial. And today we do a lot of mixed-use projects. Um, and, uh, and we do them all over. And the residentials go all the way to still, you know, affordable, the most affordable, <coughs> the, most, the least expensive projects um, to, the, you know, the highest end, you know, condominiums that are built in this market.
Thank you very much. Not many of us uh, understand the affordable housing market uh, and what that entails uh, from the constraints uh, to make sure that residents can achieve them. I'm sorry, can afford them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about kind of to help to educate the students about what that really means? We hear it all the time, but what does that mean in terms of, uh, of, of, of the actual cost and also uh, the rents that, that are charged and, and, and why you, you are passionate about doing that from, from yeah. the start? Yeah, you know, when, when, when I finished um, university, when I finished my bachelor's degree, I I um, I, uh, I went to Europe and it was supposed to be two or three months if I had enough money and ended up staying one year um, because I love cities and I, and I just spent all this time going to these great European cities and I had never experienced you know the true urban pedestrian oriented cities in which people could you know come out of their house and and go to the little shop and get their breads for the day if you look at European apartments they're their refrigerators are about one fifth of the side of American refrigerators because they don't shop, you know, for one week or one month at a time. Everything is much more fresh and so forth. And I love that that communication between people, you know, going to the local bar and so forth. So I decided that I wanted to do something with cities and I wanted to come back to the United States. At that time, I had decided to become an American citizen and make the United States my my country, my you know, um, uh, and I wanted to really you know, work in, in urban areas. But one of the things that I noticed when I came to the United States, everybody kept on talking about the 24-hour city, uh, which was my dream, right? We wanted to, and they kept on talking to cities where people can work and play and, and uh, live, you know, and shop, you know, all within, you know, a short distance, whether a walking distance or a bicycle distance. Um, I started realizing that they were talking about a 24-hour city only for the rich or for at least the middle class or the upper middle class. Because what was happening in this whole world, not just in South Florida, New York, and Chicago, is that poor people, or the working poor even, or the lower middle class, and sometimes the middle class, were totally being priced out of that urban experience that I tried to create. So in cities like London, and Miami, and Paris, and Chicago, you know, the center of the city is, is, uh, is very, very expensive because high-rise buildings by nature, you know, what you have in those cities are very, very expensive. Land becomes very expensive in those cities. So in order to produce that type of housing, you either need deep, deep subsidies or coming with some programs that will lower the cost. So as I finished, you know, my master's degree in Michigan, which was an urban planner but with a specialty in housing, particularly in affordable housing, um, I started working with Miami creating programs that um, would, would try to make housing affordable, you know, for both low-income, you know, low-income households and, you know, what I call, you know, working-class households. Um, and we created this housing program that later on, um, when I decided to go to the private sector, again, my decision was not, I'm going to make money in the private sector. Oh, yes, I wanted to have a, a better life for my family. My decision was really made on, I really want to put into practice all these things that I preached and told people to do. And, um, and that's why I did affordable housing. And there were great, great years. So go back 40 years ago in which I thought there was a housing crisis, you know, affordability crisis and you know, bring it now into 40 years from now. The crisis has gotten only worse. Affordability is worse. There's less government money to, you know, to provide for affordable housing. Um, the standards of housing have become much more onerous. So in Dade County, for example, you have a code with uh, all the hurricane codes and so forth that make housing much more expensive. Um, parking ratios haven't changed. So to, for today to build a condominium in Miami, for example, a high-rise I mean, high rental project in Miami, as cheap as you can build it, you're going to have to get $3 a square foot in rents. That means that a 1,000 square foot two-bedroom apartment, for example, will have to rent for $3,000 a month. Well, there's not that many people in Miami that can really spend $3,000 a month for a two-bedroom apartment. So the firemen, you know, 
or the secretary or the nursing assistant or the you know the technician or something has to leave outside the city and travel two hours polluting our whole environment and polluting their lives because it's pretty tough. I mean, I just came from Miami right now, right? And it took me two hours to get over here, you know? And those are the distances that people travel every day to go back and forth to work, you know? Not moving from county to county, but just from Miami to Kendall, which is a suburban neighborhood of Miami. So to me, this was uh, and still is a real problem in all the senses. A, the 24-hour cities being exclusionary by nature of cost, um, and B, in Florida, my, South Florida, has the worst housing uh, standard of any major city in the United States. You know, that's not because we have the highest cost in housing, but because the ratio between earnings and housing cost is the worst. So while housing in New York is more expensive, and in California is more expensive, and Chicago is more expensive, the salaries in those places are much higher than the one in South Florida. So that's what creates the huge housing problem, and that's why we continue to try to create programs that will allow housing to be done. And we do those in conjunction with the federal government, with the city government, with the state government, but also trying to promote uh, things such as less parking requirements you know, for urban housing, so that reduces the cost immensely. Uh, we're doing a lot of micro units right now, like we have been doing in the rest of the world except here. You know, so we're doing now studios for $350, $400 a square foot, one bedroom apartments for $500 a square foot. So um, all of those measures, working with the city to do um, to do uh, tax abatements over a certain period of time to get additional densities um, and a number of things that will bring down the cost of housing so cities you know can become affordable to as many households as possible thank you very much i've just got a huge education myself i know the students are taking notes i can see that out there that's really good uh, this next question is uh, a question that i know that uh, Mr. LeVan can relate to a Mr. Moss and Dr. True Roger. The question is, uh, what inspired you to take the leap of faith and risk everything to become an entrepreneur? I mean, I wish that was an easy answer for me. I mean, I could say that, you know, I want you know, I, 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 first of all, never thought, sorry about the business students, right, <laughs> that I would be an entrepreneur. You know, I was an entrepreneur by accident. Again, I was really a do-gooder. You know, I studied philosophy and economics um, uh, at the highest level. By that, I'm saying not economics that applied to anything. Everything here, to me, everything was, you know, you know, Samuelson and, uh, and Kenneth Galbraith and things like that, laws of supply and demand and so forth. I was much interested in, in macro, you know, economics. And then when I went to graduate school at Berkeley, I studied uh, macroeconomics for developing countries, and then at the University of Michigan, I finished in urban planning. So I never really studied to be a developer. I think they would have laughed at you. you somebody would have seen me in college and said I was going to be a developer. Um, so that's the first thing. I really didn't want to be a developer. Um, I was driven to be a developer because I did not like the public sector, and that was too constraining. And I at one point did not want to work for anybody because I really wanted to do uh, what was close to me and I wanted to do it on my own in my own way. So that's what really pushed me. Uh, I wanted to really try it out. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. I wanted to try it out. And I wanted to try it out in something that had some social consciousness and that's why it was affordable housing. And <coughs> Also, it was something that I could afford, and in those days I could get 100% financing for the government because I didn't have any money to, to start doing any of these jobs. Um, so that sort of led me to building affordable housing. The second one is risk, but you have to remember that I really didn't have much to risk, right? I really did have a very good position, you know, but at that time when I started my company I had no children. I was married. And so if it would have failed, I guess I could have always <laughs> looked for another job. So, so it isn't, you know, you know I, I, I wish I had, you know, 
a, a more meaningful answer, but I sort of, you know, accidentally became an entrepreneur. And even to these days, you know, um, I guess I am an entrepreneur, in a, in a defined person that takes, like I said, I think over there, that takes risks. I do that, I do that, you know, big ones on a, uh, on a daily basis. Um, but I think of myself as more than entrepreneur. I, I, I think of myself as somebody that is making a contribution. You know, that, that to me is, um, is far more, far more important. If, if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to wrap my epitaph right, I would hate to say the guy was worth a lot of money or the guy was a successful entrepreneur. That, that's, that, that goes way down in my, uh, in my, uh, in my qualifications of what I would like people to know me by. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk about uh, being, being an entrepreneur and taking risks and, and, and dealing with adversity. Let's go back to 2007, 2008, during the Great Recession. It affected us, uh, all of us, adversely, had an adverse impact on us. And uh, how did you position your company for survival and prosperity? And share with the students and all of us uh, what uh, strategies did you employ? Yeah, you know those were um, those were um, those were very 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 tough years. You know, uh, actually as tough as I think you can get. You know, on a very personal basis. At the same time, I got very sick. I had to have uh, I had to go to Mass General and this huge operation that. Thank God, turned out uh, to be okay. Um, so all of a sudden, you go uh, from 1979, 2009, 30 years of being this golden boy, right? Um, you know, every project that we did was successful. We never had, never had one project that went wrong. Extremely profitable company. Um, we never had to make loan packages to lenders. You know, they were fight over the projects that we did, they, they, they could get upset at me if I didn't do it with them. So I was being regaled, you know, in airplanes, taken over to, you know, the different um, centers of, uh, of finance in order to continue to promote me in trying to get them to do my loans. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, we are in a market that you know, all our projects were over 95% sold with 20% quote-unquote non-returnable deposits. Um, and there was the largest collapse in real estate, probably in the history of the United States. You know, people talk about the Great Recession in the, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, almost was born there, but I, not, I wasn't born there, so I never went to that. But in my experience, nothing even came close, you know to the speed and to the depth of the fall. And Miami, you know, actually all of South Florida and Southwest Florida was probably the epicenter of that. I mean, I can't think of worse areas, maybe Las Vegas, you know, but we really, really got hit. And all these contracts that were supposed to be contracts not only collapsed, you know, um, but America has a lot of attorneys <laughs> Uh, and they figured a way of suing every developer and trying to get the deposits that were supposed to be non-returnable to be returned. So, you know, you, you one day are facing about $4 million worth of sales, which are already booked into your, into your things, and you have about $2 billion, a little, actually about $2.5 billion worth of construction, and sales become zero. Um, and you have two and a half billion dollars to pay. As Mr. Levan knows as a banker, that that's a sort of a difficult situation. And to make the situation more difficult, right, all our bankers, which had become very, very close friends, and they were the chairmen of these large, large banks, of course somebody has to be blamed for the disaster, so they throw all these bankers out. I get all new bankers, and they all seem like 22-year-old uh, graduate students <laughs> telling me what to do. And to make the matters even worse, you know, you know, and they blame, of course, them, the old guys, and me, you know, and the developers. To make matters even worse, I thought I had six banks, which are the ones that we had done all this business with, and the loans had gotten so big 
uh, that all of them had been participated to other banks. So instead of having six banks, I had 80 banks, all of which could say no to an agreement globally and ruin and get all the dominoes to fall. So as you can see, that's just not a very pretty picture, right? So I had to play a lot of poker. That's when you, you know, separate the men from the boys or the girls from the women. Um, uh, it, it was a very difficult, difficult time. And uh, I think one of the proudest things in my career, I will always say this, uh, you know, I finished writing a book. I mean, finished writing a book. I wrote a book in 2008, you know, uh, talking about this, you know, how to be a developer, a very successful book, New York Times, bestseller, and so forth. And of course, it went down when, when the developers disappeared. Um, but now Penguin, which is a publishing house, wants to write a book because the editors think that's probably, you know, the brightest part of the career. How, how do you turn that tremendous deficit that you have in dealing with 80 lenders into um, a workable situation in which you can survive again and, and re, you know, sort of recreate yourself? Right? Uh, so this was very, very difficult because I had to play two very distinct roles in my company. On one side, I was putting out fires, just a very negative, negative environment in which I convinced all these banks that we were the best solution to produce the best results for all these projects that were in trouble when there was no market, you know, uh, no, no light at the end of the tunnel. And with the sheep mentality, all these banks start dropping, you know, properties, you know, that were selling for $600, $700 a foot for $100 a foot. So I look at that, and at the same time I look at this, and I say, this, the world is not going to collapse, you know. Um, we will do better over time, particularly a place like South Florida, where I believe that in the long run is one of the best markets in the world because people want to come here. So on one, I created basically two companies, one that dealt with the workouts, which did very well finally and got rid of all that stuff and everybody came out a lot better than I did. In the process, we lost <coughs> a little bit over a billion dollars in cash. Um, and then created this, what I call family and friends, mostly family and myself, but a lot of friends invested with me, um, into buying distressed assets. So while at one time we were trying to get rid of this, you know, the banks were giving away these things which I thought were just gimmies, and we started buying assets everywhere in the United States for a fraction of the cost in areas that I thought were going to be good areas and come back, and that led to uh, the reestablishment of the company. When we sold those, we did extremely well and, um, and gave us the, uh, the capital to, to um, and immediately when the recession finished and we saw the first signs, um, we hit it very, very, very hard um, and were very successful in, in the developments again. Outstanding. Outstanding story. That's an amazing story for all of us. Uh, shifting gears a bit. Uh, you love the arts. You love art. Uh, what influenced your passion for art? I remember in your discussion, you even put a lot of uh, lovely art in the affordable housing projects. But what, what fueled your passion for the arts? My mother. I, I, you know, I think at, on, on an early age, um, I'm a product of a of a, um, a businessman father who was a, an amazing salesman uh, and business guy um, and a totally unbusiness intellectual artistic mother um, and she would just grab me and uh, take me to museums at the beginning kicking and screaming you know who wants to go to a museum on a Saturday right um, <laughs> but this developed um, you know, subconsciously a passion for not only art, but design and beauty, you know, and I think that in, in the long run helped me tremendously. You know, I'm the one that, with architects and designers, gets very involved in the actual design of the buildings. I'm the one that picks the art, two full-time curators in the company, 
Um, but I'm the one with them that picks the art. I probably attend more art fairs and more galleries and more exhibits and more artist studios. Um, and and this, you know, was my mother. You know, my mother talking about it. You know, you know, uh, discussing it. And and it went beyond just the the, the, the visual part of the art. Um, but it was in in theater and movies. Uh, she was a great movie buff and a great theater person. Had three graduate degrees, you know, uh, taught university, and we would I remember sitting when I was still in just 13, 14, you know, we're talking about Jean Paul Sartre and Kierkegaard and the great existential philosophers and Descartes, and, you know, I mean, and these things, which probably any other kid my age or probably be going, who are these people, you know, um, was almost part of my um, training. Um, and like I said, many times I really did not want to go uh, to talk to my mother because the conversations would be, you know, complex. You know, my father was much more fun. My father was a, you know, a guy's guy. You know, he would love to um, joke, and um, so I think my mother instilled that, and then my father probably instilled, you know, the business uh, aspect, um, and I'm a product of both of those. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we encourage our students uh, as uh, they embark upon their journeys and their careers to, uh, to find mentors, uh, women and men that can help us uh, throughout our journey. And uh, would you share with us uh, your favorite mentors or the, the, the women and men who have, who have helped you to, to chart your career? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think as young people, um, you gotta create your own mentors. You gotta look for your mentors, right? I mean, um, um, I've been very lucky all through my uh, my career. First of all, starting like I said before, with parents that were my strongest mentors. You know, as I was growing up, you know, uh, just by the example that they set. These are people that lost all their money in Cuba and just didn't even bother. They would still speak. They were still liberal Democrats, believe it or not. He's talked about the injustice of certain societies and why some revolutions have to be. Um, I mean, they were great, great role models. And then as I went to college and then graduate school, I was very keen on picking those professors that I felt, and I would look at it, actually study, you know, those professors that I thought were, it would be intellectually challenging to me and became very close with many of my professors and became a graduate student, uh, a teaching student um, when I was in graduate school. Actually, I even taught an undergraduate um, because of these professors. And, 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 and those people encouraged me to think, you know, told me what to read, you know. Um, and we had very, very um, intelligent conversations all through my uh, university years. Uh, and, 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 and those, you know, actually they, got me my first jobs, you know, and, uh, and those guys were very influential in, in how my career developed. And then I got really, again, very lucky um, when I started working uh, as a consultant with this man that ran one of the biggest um, research firms, you know, um, that took me under his wings um, in the city of Miami at that time. We had a a visionary mayor and an incredible city manager that also took me under their wings, you know, and at, at age 27, I became the head of community development, economic development in the city of Miami, you know, telling all these 50 year old people what to do, which that's why I grew my beard, so I wanted to look a little older, you know, and I was my, you know, young looking kid. Um, and then when I went to business, I've been very fortunate, not only Steve Ross, who's been my partner for 40 years, and we're just very, very, very close, but almost all the partners that I've had, you know, have been contributors to, uh, to my career, you know, so, so you really got to look, you know, I, I don't like wasting time with people that don't contribute to my life, you know, I guess I'm a little bit of an elitist when it comes to that, I, uh, I think we have very limited time, and I think I, 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 I like to think that I want to, I want to spend it with people that add, right? And those are your mentors. They, they, hopefully, they're your friends and your mentors, and 
and uh, and that's those are the things the people that are going to encourage it and make it grow as a as a human being. Thank you. Let's have some questions from the students in the audience, if you don't mind. I think it's we can do yeah. that. Can I be the first one? Absolutely. Mr. Perez, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I've been reading about you for many years, and yeah, you were a very influential person in my life. Um, I'm doing a master's in real estate development at Nova Southeastern University. Um, is, I, have, I even have your book right here with me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very impressive what have you done in your life, your accomplishments. Um, I have two questions for you. Well, one was already answered, so I only have one. Um, what advice would you give to a, a young person like me that is very in, impatient and wants to start a business and is very passionate about creating things and putting deals together? What would be the best advice for you um, before I take that leap of faith? And <laughs> yeah, look. Um, it, it seems like you have the most important ingredient already, right? Which is the passion, right? I mean, I, I talk to you know I have you know children a little older than you guys are, and one that's you know 14. So, um, you know, I, I always think of three ingredients, right? I, you know, I think of um, you you, you got to be the most prepared person in the world, and you got to be the most educated, right? So when I went and I prepared, you know, when I went to investors, you know. I mean, there wasn't one thing that they could ask me that I was not ready for, you know? And that comes from the education that you have in the university all the way to when you finish, you know, um, doing market studies. You know, you gotta be, you know, the more prepared you are, you know, the more you're going to succeed because people are going to believe in you. And particularly when you start, you know, you gotta make people believe in you. You know, so that's number one. Number two, I have just not met anybody yet. Everybody says luck and this and that. That does not succeed because of extreme hard work. I remember when I started my company, it was 20 hours a day, literally 20 hours a day, seven days a week. It was brutal. I had to outwork everybody. And the third thing, which is very important, is what you mentioned, is that all these things without passion for what you do, um, are not going to get you there. So for me, it, you're going to get burned out. You know, I see people that work very hard and don't like what they're doing, um, and typically it doesn't work. You know, I think you need to have that passion, a, to express yourself, and so people believe in you, right? And so you believe in yourself, right? So, so that's that's what continues to drive all the other things. You know, that's what continues to make me successful. Thank you for that advice. Um, last thing, do you mind signing my book? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Would you give her the mic? What's your name? Um, Louise Mendes. Mendes. That's how you do it. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> Any other questions from the students? Louise, I'll give you a thousand dollars for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just one question. I'm right here. Oh, sorry. How do you deal with all this stress that you have in that moment that all the banks, 80 banks and the, the market collapse? You know, it's, um, it's, uh, <coughs> again, right, I mean, fear, you know, and I think we all have fear, you know, I, I, when I remember when I was young, I still, you know, but particularly when I was young and starting a business, I, I'd be petrified every day, right, I mean, I would go, oh my God, I'm going to fail, I don't know how I'm going to meet payroll, you know, I mean, um, and then fear for some people, it paralyzes them, 
you know, to me, it drove me to be the best or to try to be the best, right? So it's good to have fear, right? It, but you should use fear to motivate you, you know? Um, and that's what I think we've done. When you have the problems, when you have the problems that we have, I'm a very, um, if, you know, my staff would always say that I scream and I'm very emotional and, and you know, um, and very passionate. But when I have problems, is when I become totally calm. Um, it's unbe- I don't know why. I mean, I totally go into this state in which all I do is think, 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 um, and the emotion almost comes out of me, and um, and I just um, I think of the mistakes. I think of what that I did wrong. You know, I I, I, I analyze and analyze those things. Um, and those are the ones, and those are the things that help me go to that next step. Because if not, you'll continue to tumble over the same things, you know. So um, on one side, I have to control that desire to do everything yesterday and so forth, and just become very calm. Um, <coughs> so that calmness. See, when I'm developing, you know, my passion and and my energy is what brings others to go become passionate and energetic. When you've got a lot of problems, it's the calmness, you know, that gets everybody to be calm and to believe in you and to think more clearly in very difficult times that there is an end to this and there will be a better future. So it is difficult situations and, you know, and you just got to grow very thick skin and uh, and think yourself through things. Any other questions? Yes, we have a question back there. Good evening. Once you develop the properties, what's the next step? Are you selling them? Or are you? What happens once they're built? And um. Um. For us, sort of, that's a difficult question. When we do affordable housing, for example, we always keep them. We become the general partners and we syndicate the properties. So in effect, we are the ones that call all the shots. And we have all these investors that typically buy, come in because of tax credits and all they want to do is to get fixed and tax credits. And we have a lot of those. So we keep those, you know, um, you know, for the long run. When we do condominiums, of course, we sell them one by one. I mean, they were always still be my babies, but in fact, the owners of the new condominiums are the ones that will have their condominium association and they will run it. And many times, all my beautiful designs and furniture and art, they will replace it, which drives me nuts. But they do that. So I lose that, you know, in a condominium basis. And when we do rentals, and we do it in two ways. Sometimes we sell them right away, and sometimes we keep it for our family over the so it varies um, depending on what typically my long-term tax strategy and family planning strategy is. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, George, uh, oftentimes when we when we work with the students. Um, sometimes it's difficult for the students to understand it's not a straight line from where they are as a freshman or as a senior or getting an MBA to where you might be today. And um, uh, I wonder wonder if you could just expound a little bit on the fact that how that line goes up and down in terms of thought process. For example, why in the world would you have been a philosophy major if if you were interested in building cities, you know what? What were you thinking about as a college student that you can think back to today that got you where you are today? I mean, you you, you, you don't even have to think that far back, right? I mean, it, it, 
it, it's a very interesting question because my staff always, you know, comes to me and says, but you told us last week, you know, I mean, just a week, right? And I said, you know, unfortunately, the world changes very, very, very rapidly. Now, more rapidly than ever. When I was in college, changes came, I mean, shoot, you know, computer classes, we had these cards that you punched in uh, little things, right? I, you know, um, today, everything is changing at such a speed that if you don't have that capacity to adapt, you know, and adapt rapidly, you know, you're not going, you're going to fail, you know? So, so we can be building, for example, say rental products, you know, and if we build, you know, rentals that are a thousand square feet and that's worked really well and we continue doing that, we would be broke because the market could be calling for 2,000 square feet or it could be calling for micro units. So in projects that we started that had, you know, a, like you said, a straight line like this, we might be in the middle and say, hey, architect, change this, we're going into totally a different product. So, you know, we react to the market, you know, and when you react to the market, and the market is constantly changing, people's you know, wants and tastes are constantly changing, you have to become, you know, very reactive, you know, and you know, if, if, it, if it was what I wanted to do, it would probably be a straight line. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But it's not what I want to do. It's what the market gives me to do, right? So it's, you know, I, I am very good. For example, when we design in Wynwood, Wynwood is a neighborhood in Miami, which is sort of hip, young, and so forth, right? I don't put myself, you know, to do the design of that project. We get into a group and we get everybody that's going to live in Wynwood because what the hell do I know about how a 22-year-old lives nowadays or a 25-year-old, right? <laughs> so we get the people in our company that are in that age bracket, right, and they start feeding me information. So what does that mean for me? For me, it means it's a radical change, you know, in the way I perceive this development responding to what the market, you know, what the market demands are. And if you're open, you know, to those type of changes, then, then, then you and the projects and everything else in the company starts changing radically. So even if I want to be a condominium developer now, for example, and I have no sales in condominium, I can either go broke by trying to continue to build condominiums or, you know, figure out a totally different market strategy. And while we had that straight line that said, hey, in the year 2019, we were going to have so many condominium units, that totally changes. And that not only changes, you know, the fact that I'm going to do different jobs, but to do, for example, affordable housing, where I would have to take some people that were in the condominium division to affordable housing division, it's a totally different thought process. So in this changing world, um, we have to just adapt constantly uh, to that change, or else we perish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is, uh, how do you envision the price of uh, luxury condominiums in the near future? And the second question would be, how does the funding differ from the for sale condominiums to the rental units? You mean the funding? You mean the financing? Or? The financing, yeah. Okay. Um, in, uh, so, the, so the first question. You know, Florida is probably, uh, the, when it comes to condominiums, it's probably the biggest roller coaster market in the United States. And the reason for that is that it is impossible to uh, assess, you know, scientifically assessed demand in South Florida uh, because of the international market. So while in Atlanta, for example, if we're selling condominiums, 80%, 90% really of the market would be Atlantans, right? You know, in Miami, 80% of, 90% of my condominium markets, for example, in downtown will be foreigners, okay? So in Atlanta, I can do very scientific studies that says, 
here's the population growth. There's so many households, you know, per population. You know, the employment characteristics are these. There's so many people in these income brackets. The building permits on my supply side are this. So I can build this thing, and I should expect to have a certain level of demand. In Miami, how the hell do I know how many Brazilians <laughs> are going to buy condominiums for me, or Mexicans, or whatever it is? It all depends on whether Lula goes to jail, or whether that, <laughs> you know? So the demand parameters are almost impossible to assess, right? So given all that, um, when we had the last recession, everybody said, there's a 20-year supply of condominiums in Miami. There's no way this market is coming back. In three years, it came back, not because of the demand from the locals, but from international demand, which, again, was impossible to, to measure. Um, so what is going to happen to the price of condominium? Um, I think not only in Miami, but everywhere almost in the world, luxury condominiums have been overbuilt. It is probably the sector that has been most overbuilt, right? If you being so business guys, so being, you know, being you know, business students and knowing supply and demand, that probably means that there will be at least an equilibrium and not a an increase. Uh, and there could be a price correction. Not like during the recession, and the reason for that is leverage. All the condominiums that we sell today are 50% down payments, so nobody's dropping out of 50% down payments. And this time, we've learned our lessons, we made them really 50% down payments. We are closing units now. We have not had one default in thousands of units that we've already closed this year. Um, your second question is financing. So financing in condominiums is totally different than financing in rental apartments. Uh, let me just take first rentals. In the old days, the old days, 10 years ago, <laughs> the rentals were, uh, you could get 85 to 90 percent financing in rentals, even more if you got Fannie Mae or some government you know, financing. Today, banks have become very conservative, and that's also very good because it's going to prevent an explosion. So today, if you can get a 70% loan on a rental, on a to be built rental apartment, it, you will be doing very, very well, particularly if you're not putting personal guarantees. Now loans are in the 60% range, uh, non-recourse loans, uh, and that is good, I think. Um, in condominiums, in particular in South Florida, it is based on the pre-sales that you achieve for a condominium. So a lender will, will lend you according to what they feel will cover their loan. So the loans are much, much lower than during the last... Uh, so today, banks and condominiums are so incredibly conservative. So you're getting lend, loaned 30% um, of sales. So... Um, I should be a lender, right? I mean, I mean, they, 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 it's very, very safe money in the condominium. And even with that safe money, it's still sort of a little bad, bit of a bad word, you know? Um, um, so, you know, that's what's happening with condominiums. In other cities, incredibly so, the lending for condominiums is much greater. So you will take LA, for example, California, or New York, uh, or even Atlanta, where people are coming with 5% down payments and the lenders are giving higher loans for those condominiums without the pre-sales than in South Florida. I guess because they didn't have the explosions that we had, um, but still to me, that is very risky lender. As a matter of fact, it's not only very risky lending, that's why we do no condominiums in California or Atlanta, and Ross is doing them in New York, you know, um, the, the different assessment, because I would think that I don't really have a contract if the guy puts 5% down and he actually has a right to get that 5% back. You know, what, what do I have? If that market becomes bad, a 5% change in pricing would cause a total um, collapse of your, of your sales. Thank you. I just wanted to be more on what he asked about the financing. 
Uh, what do you think is the level of impact on EB5 funding in regional centers here in South Florida where we see like, a huge number of immigrants coming and trying to get their paperwork and all this? Yeah, we produce EB5 very successfully in New York, um, but EB5 works when you create employment. We are much more of a residential builder, and EB5 really does not work well uh, for residential projects. It works fantastic for office shopping centers where you create full-time, full-term uh, full employment. Uh, so far, by far, the greatest amount of EB5 is coming from China, um, and it's still coming. So. Yes, it's a way of, um, it's, a, it's a fairly inexpensive way of financing without guarantees. Thank you. Chancellor Ferrero, I, I think I can speak up loud enough without the mic. Uh, I'm going to ask you to look into the future. I'm particularly interested in economic mm. development. <laughs> Good. We're both on the same wavelength now. Uh, I'm particularly interested in economic development, particularly Broward County. So take me out for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what do you see in downtown or, or in Broward County? And contrast it with what you said about it being a great market and uh, the types of units that you're having to consider building, etc., and the American passion for the automobile. Wow. <laughs> you know, whenever I answer... This is your chance to speak. <laughs> I hope you know that I would give you a totally different answer. This was made out of brokers and possible buyers, right? Um, but, uh, and, you know, um, look, I strongly believe that the future of the world is in more dense cities. Um, I think the use of the automobile will decrease greatly and change greatly. The driven automobile will be something that will be something of the past in not too many years ahead. I attend a lot of artificial intelligence conferences, and I will tell you that they're talking five, seven years before you just call a car and the car can pick you up and it'll go park someplace else outside the city and come back. That will change the whole way. They already do that in New York, right? No. No, no, no. Drivers of cars are just right now, uh, they've had a couple of accidents, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's still in, in the formative stages. Um, but I think people are going to congregate in cities because that's the only way that we are going to survive global warming and screwing up the environment forever. Um, so I'm a strong, strong believer in urban densities. We still, unfortunately, in Florida, in South Florida, have to provide parking because people are still enamored by the car. So whatever I want to do, if I build in Lauderdale an apartment without parking, I'm going to have a lot of trouble renting it or selling it. Nevertheless, I think that we will be less dependent on cars. I think if I was an investor, I would be putting my money in urban areas as opposed to far away suburban areas. Um, and I think South Florida, um, particularly, you know, Broward and, and, and Dade County, will continue to be areas that attract huge amounts of population because the more technologically advanced we get, the less important it is to be in New York or to be in other places that have become very, very expensive. So if I sold a luxury condominium in Brickell Avenue, for example, which is, you know, the, our Madison Avenue or Fifth Avenue, it will go for anywhere between $500 and $700 a square foot. The same apartment in that type of address in New York will probably be four to $5,000 a square foot. You know, Boston, 1200 LA, Thousand twelve hundred Chicago going up to eight nine hundred similar areas right um, comparing apples to apples Miami and, and when I call Miami I call the greatest SMSA right is already you know when you look when you do the surveys of 
the six most popular, the ten the most popular uh, international cities, it ranks number six in, in, in almost every service in the top ten. So there's a strong desire for people from the United States and from elsewhere to come to South Florida. When we have that discrepancy in prices, where today I'm selling that condominium in Miami at the same price or less than I'm selling it in Buenos Aires, which is a city that really has no international market, or Mexico City, I think that there's a discrepancy here. There's this disparity in the pricing that we have. So my gut is that we will be catching up in pricing to all these other international cities, all of which, including Paris, London, Singapore, are much higher priced <coughs> than we are. Um, what, you know, the, the big question mark is, are we going to be smart and be ecologically conscious, or are we going to let, you know, sea rise and global warming take the best of us? Um, and that's a question that's all for us to answer, right? One more question? Yes. Mr. Perez, what is your take on the gentrification of um, neighborhoods that had been affordable to working class and then as they become gentrified, they, their kind of status goes You know, um, it, it, it goes back to, again, to, to, you know, to what I was saying, you know, um, you know that, that um, lower income households are being priced out of the market, right? But fortunately, unfortunately, we live in a market trade society, which, you know, the market, you know, commands what is going to happen to any neighborhood, right? Uh, so you can't zone according to income, right? You can't say, we can't, we're not going to allow high income households to come into Fat Village or Little Havana or whatever, the, you know, the surrounding urban neighborhoods are. Um, you can help create certain laws by which you can provide certain houses for certain groups of people so they are included in that development. Um, but gentrification is a natural process of um, the growth of cities. You know, we've seen every, every neighborhood, Wynwood, for example, it's not just people, right? Wynwood was known for its art galleries. More and more art galleries cannot afford, you know, the, the rents in Wynwood. So they will go into, now they're going to Alapata, you know, which is the next neighborhood. And I am telling you already, you know, five years from now, they're going to have to go to Little River and then to, uh, you know, I don't know, you know. Um, and that's just a natural process, which many times is painful, but it's part of, you know, the capitalist system. One last question for you. Would you have any uh, words of wisdom for our students as we close our evening? No, I think between the tape and everything that we said, I mean, I'm run out of you know words of wisdom uh, or whatever those things were. You know, I, I go back to the, to the to this young man. You know, I I was um, I was um, I was um, very fortunate to have a, a you know a um, a an honorary doctorate degree, and, and, and that's what, you know, they wanted me to talk about. Um, and, and it's exactly what I said, you know. I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of students, um, when, they're, when they're getting that, right, you're, you're going to go and, and, and make a future for yourself, and you're looking at that position, the first job that you're going to take, and, and many times uh, you'll make that decision on purely economic terms, you know, um, and, and I urge you, you know, uh, not to do that, you know, I urge you to, to consider what's your fit, you know, where, where are you going to be able to work best, you know, what area are you interested in, so if you're not, if you're not into accounting and they pay you more to be an accountant and you want to be in real estate sales, don't become an accountant because typically you're not going to be very successful at it. You know, um, the same way, you know, when you look at companies, the philosophy and the MO of a company, it's really important. So some people can be extremely successful in one type of company, for example, that has a great training program for every department, 
and other ones can be very successful in a much more entrepreneurial, wild type environment. So, who, what fits you? You know, where, where do you want to be? You know, and 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 I tell that, and I tell everybody that I that I interview. You know, um, is, is this is a two way street? You know, it's not just do we like you, but do you like us? And and that's the way you're going to be successful. Thank you, Mr. Perez. I have a little something for you. I'd like to invite Mr. Levan up and with Creature Colleague to come up with Mr. Moss. <laughs> This is just a small token of our appreciation for the great lecture that you gave and for all that you do for us in, in South Florida. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. And with that, that closes our evening. And please uh, feel free to come up and shake his hand.